believe that this morning. Things too hard for you. Impossible is what you do. I know you got this too. Impossible is what you do. Nothing's too hard. Nothing's too hard for you. Impossible is what
just getting started with River Park. That means that there's more for you and more that God wants to do with and through you. And that's what I want to talk about today, a message I've entitled, Made for More, Releasing the More that You Were Made For. All right? Made for more, releasing the more that you were made for. So let's look in the book of Genesis. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. It's the farthest to the left. If you're not sure about it, if you've got your digital device, well, that's a total different category. So uh, uh, the book of Genesis, though, is the first book of a volume of books. We often think of the Bible as one book. Actually, it's a collection of books, uh, 66 books with a variety, 40 authors written over a couple thousand years. So it's a collection of sacred and holy writings that were imparted by God, by His Holy Spirit, uh, to men and, and women of old. This tells the story, written by men, but the women are there as well. And so how many are glad, can I get a woman's amen, that you're in the book as well? Praise God for that. Delighted to have my wife with me. This is her third time to be out on the road with me since brain surgery in July of last year, and a stroke that happened afterwards. And so... Uh, this is her second service, and darling, I love you. I'm so delighted. I told somebody in the 
first service when I pointed her out. I said, she was that girl I was making out with during worship over there in the dark. Yeah, so delighted to have her. Genesis chapter number one, let me show you what I'm going to talk about. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is the story of creation. And then as we move a little further down into the story, let's take a look at that. Genesis 1 verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. Let the earth bring forth grass. This, on this particular day of creation, the third day, this is the organic life is beginning. God is creating organic life. So he creates the plants and he creates all of the vegetation and the foliage that we see on the earth and then puts within it the ability to reproduce and then says that process will involve a sowing of the seed. Sowing of a seed, okay? And then let's go a little further in verse number 20 and 22 uh, for your attention. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above or fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures. This is when Moby Dick was created probably or his ancestor. And every living thing that moves uh, with which the waters abounded. As we're reading those passages, I want you to notice some words like abundance and abound and abounded. These are big words. These are more words, words of more, okay? And so uh, then this happens, and of course it happens according to its kind, and God said it was good in verse 22. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea. Let the birds multiply on the earth. And then we move to that last passage. I want to draw your attention to verse 27. Now he's creating man. So we've got the plants. We've got now the animals or some of the animals. Some of them are created on the same day that God created man. But specifically man, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, God blessed them, God blessed them, and said, be fruitful and multiply. All right, you can close your Bible or hold your phone to the side of the moment. Let me pray for you as we ask the Lord to anoint this moment that we look into his word together. Father, thank you for this powerful church and the worship, God, we've just enjoyed. Thank you for the spirit of God that's in this room. I pray, God, that you will anoint our hearts to receive. Lord, we, re we open our, as much as we can, we open our filters and we say, here we are, God, speak to us. And Lord, we will receive your truth and your word with gladness. In Jesus' great name, amen. High five somebody before you're seated. Tell them, get ready for the word of the Lord. God bless you. I have a simple message for you today but I think it's pregnant with possibilities. <laughs> That's kind of a cool alliteration, pregnant with possibilities. It may feel a little bit for a moment like a late night pitch guy. I guess there's a little bit of a pitch man in me. It's hard to be in ministry and not because I'm selling the best thing in the world. I'm selling good news, right? Well, thank you, the three of you that believe it's good news. Amen. Well, but wait, there's more. Yeah. Just hold on a moment. Let me say a few things about more in your life. If you're not careful, life will shut you down. If you're not careful, the hard knocks of life will convince you that there's really nothing better for you than what you've already experienced. But I have to tell you this morning that God has more planned for you than a broken heart, a busted relationship, and an empty bank account. God has more planned for you. There is something better, a better day, a better life. Better. If you read the scripture and you look at the word of God as it relates to things that God did, he did these kinds, he used these kinds of words. Better, abundant, multiply. Jesus said in one place, he said, the enemy comes only to still kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have abundant life. 
life and have it more abundantly. Here's some things that I want to share with you today about God. I want you to know that God is a God of more. God is a God of more. God wants to have more in your life because it's in His nature. You can look at creation. I've just read it to you and realized that God didn't design creation just to have one and no more. God designed creation to produce more and more in increasingly larger quantities. That's the nature of God because God is a creator. God is a designer. God is a God who wants to multiply. When God thinks of success, people say, well, there's no success words used in the Bible. Well, there's a big success word in the sense of what God thinks success is. It's a word he calls fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. And how many know that even the basic laws of agriculture tell us that a farmer doesn't plant a seed like, you know, you plant a a plant and you hope to get one little fruit off that. You don't plant an apple seed and hope to get one apple. You're, a, you're going to get a tree and that tree is going to produce bushels of apples. And on those, in those apples there's four or five seeds. There is an orchard in every fruit of the harvest and it was God's idea. Look at your neighbor and say it was God's idea. It wasn't some late night televangelist that's trying to get your money. No, no, it was God's idea because God is a blesser. God is a multiplier. God is a God who wants to produce more because God is a God of more. And when I get to this point in a moment about you, God wants more for you, you have to start, though, by first believing that God is a God of more. Not that just He has created you for more, but that He is a God of more. That means God's not trying to figure it out, trying to make up His mind, or trying to decide whether God wants to bless you. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, God wants to bless you. I'm telling you, the live audience, the audience online, God wants to bless you. It doesn't matter what's happened in your life. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter the things you've done or what's been done to you. God has not changed his mind about you. He wants to bless you and multiply the fruit that he's put in your life. Praise God, Brother Brass. That's a good place to say amen. Everything God created, he created good. If you read the entirety of the creation story, you'll find that God created this, and he looked at it. That's good. He created that. that, That's good. God created good. Part of the goodness of God's creation was that living things had the capacity to multiply. Plants grow with seeds that, when planted, produce more plants. Trees bear fruit with seeds that grow Trees. And every fluffy head of wheat, there is a field waiting to be planted and stewarded to harvest. In every tree that bears fruit, there are fruit with seeds inside that are waiting. An orchard is present in every one. This was God's idea. So the very first point that I want to tell you about God is God is a God of more. God's not a hold on to the bitter end. God's not a hold on, little dab will do you. Come on, somebody. That may be your God, but that's not my God. The experience I've had with God is God wants to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that I cannot even begin to contain. He can't help himself because it's literally entwined and involved in his very essence of who he is. Mankind was no different. You might say it this way. Multiplication was God's genius Genesis idea. Multiplication was God's genius Genesis idea. I don't know if there are any engineers in the room or or designers, but how would it be to have the the insight and the understanding, the, 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 the complexity, the acumen to understand all that could be done if you could produce something that could reproduce itself and then do it in larger multiples and create a sustainable species. <laughs> That's engineering to another level. Can I get an amen? amen? That's engineering off the chart. Multiplication was God's genius, Genesis idea. And that God hasn't changed his mind. When we go to Genesis, we talk about it theologically and we say that we see the ontological foundations of creation. That's a fancy word that means that we see that how God did it in creation can be forecasted for us to think this is how God's going to do it later on. What are the theological foundations of that? We say that God is omniscient. He knows everything, 
God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. But he's also imminent. That means you can't escape God. He's everywhere. So if he's my source of blessing and it's his heart to multiply and I'm his child and he's living inside of me, then guess what? Everywhere I go, there is a multiplying, producing engine of more and more and more, more than enough. Life may face may cause me to be confronted with some circumstances and situations that it seems like there's lack and there's no hope. But the devil is a liar, y'all. Can I preach to y'all for a minute? I said the devil is a liar because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And if by faith you'll obey the commands of God, he'll release that incredible power of his multiplying glory. And every other big word I can think to say right now. Yeah, I, I work with leaders all over the country, a lot of young folks, a lot of every age folks, and one of the common things we all struggle with is thinking that there's not more for us or that God's through or that one blessing that we got that one time is all that God's ever going to do. But I'm trying to tell you all this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that the nature of God, God's looking for an opportunity to bless you. He's looking for an opportunity to multiply His goodness in your life. He's looking for an opportunity to set you up where what will go right will at the very best possible moment. Not Murphy's Law, that what will go wrong will at the worst possible time. That's not the law of God. The law of God is what can go right will at the best possible moment. I'm about to preach my own self into a fit today. <laughs> I don't want to hurt myself. <laughs> I walked up to our brother on the drugs. He was tearing it up, man. And I leaned up behind that and I said, I just want you to know I can do all that. <laughs> just so you know, I could do all that. Everything you're doing, I could do it. <laughs> God's a God of more. He wants to produce more in your life. Multiplication was God's genius, Genesis idea. You were created for more. This story of creating men and women for more is all over the scripture. It's reiterated through the patriarchs, the covenant promises. Anybody ever heard of the covenant promises of God? What is that if that's not a promise of more? What are the promises of God if they're not promises of of more. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were all promised great blessings and multiplication in descendants and wealth. And wealth. For those of you that think God doesn't want to bless you, just when you go home this afternoon, read Psalms 112. Read Psalms 112. Just a little additional reading for you when you have a chance. And if you read that Psalm two or three times, it'll convince you. I promise you. It'll convince you that God wants to bless you. How though and this is maybe the million dollar question. And some of you, it's probably there. It's in the room. Okay, brother, I get it. It does have a little hot vibe to it, but I get it. But how in the world do I release the more that I was made for? Anybody thinking that? I believe it theologically. I believe it theoretically. I see it on the, on the drawing board. I get what you're saying. I understand about creation. But how in the world do I experience the more that I was made for? Well, the linchpin of more, at least the way God designed it, is a big word. I like big words. It's a big word called obedience. It's not so big in its syllable count or its letter count. It's big in the challenging part of that. Because how many believe that today often, I'll say it in my life, when I got away from God's purpose, it was because I did it my own self. I sought my own way, had a better idea, thought I could produce something in my life through my own ingenuity, my own native genius, my own gifts, skills, and talents. But I've come to understand that if God has ever done anything good in me, it was God good. If it was God has ever used us to do anything great, it was God great, y'all. And that meant the part that I played in the process was simply obedience. Obedience. Obedience suggests faith and expectancy is built by hope in the hope of a better way, a better day, and a better life. And this is the story of Abraham. I mentioned Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the story. 
Abraham believed for a better city, the scripture says. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. God called him away from the area of his home life where his family was and where he was from. And he went searching for something God was going to show him. And the fruit of his obedience was the covenant of faith that we all stand. The foundation of our faith in Christ is built in the faith of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham, we call it. That was the fruit of his obedience. The Bible says in another place that Isaac, his son, in the time of a famine, there's like a pandemic going on, and nobody is using their seed corn to plant because they know it will be destroyed by the famine. But because of Isaac's confidence in God and his faith in God's ability to produce in his life, the scripture says that Isaac planted in the year of famine and reaped a hundredfold return. Jacob, his son, made a vow with God. He's a wayward boy. He's on the, hey, listen, he's not doing it the right way. This is a boy that's having some problems. He skips out of town, leaves his family. But God had made a promise to his granddad and to his dad. He's a child of the promise, but he's not living in the fulfillment of the blessing. And in that moment, God reveals the truth of covenant and power to him in Jacob's ladder. Some of you, besides Huey Lewis in the news, you know what I'm saying. There's a story in the Bible about Jacob's ladder. And in Jacob's ladder, God shows Jacob how covenant works. And Jacob responds in obedience and makes a vow. He became the nation of Israel. And from the nation of Israel came the word of God. And from the nation of Israel came the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. How many believe that's pretty good fruit for an act of obedience right there? We are each blessed by God and released the more God has bent up for us through an act of obedience when we strike a match of faith. In the science of energy, there are two kinds of energy. There's kinetic energy and there is potential energy. Kinetic energy is energy in motion, right? Kinetic energy is the fire in your fireplace. Potential energy is the fire logs out back. But how many of you understand to get the potential energy out of the logs and into the fireplace on fire, somebody's got to strike a match. Somebody's got to do something. The, pro the scientific process is called energy transfer. And the thing that stands between the firewood and the fire is change. Can I ask you this today? What would you be willing to change to release the more God made you for? It's one thing to say, oh, God can do that. He's got that great capability. It's his nature, yes. God's designed me with that potential, yes. But obedience is the headwaters of the change that you have to be willing to make to set the logs of God's potential in your life on fire and put a fire in your soul that will transform your life. What are you willing to change? What is your next act of obedience? Every one of us in this room have a command to obey. Every one of us. The question is, when are you going to obey? When are you going to take a step? When are you going to strike the match? It's almost like the Lord standing at the door of your heart and knocking. Somebody's knocking at the door. Somebody's ringing the bell. Somebody's knocking at the door. Somebody's ringing the bell. Do me a favor. Open the door and let them in. What's your next act of obedience? When you take that step, we also find that when God begins to release more in your life, it brings glory to God. It's not just so you can have the lust of your flesh satisfied. No, God wants to produce more in your life because it brings glory to God when he does. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 15. Remember the famous passage, those of you that are up on your home, your home group studies, or how many remember where Jesus says in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, that verse passage also says, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. 
much fruit. God's a God of more. You were made for more. When you bear more, you give glory to God. And obedience is the match that strikes the wood and brings it on fire in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you receive the word of the Lord today? Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for this beautiful congregation. God, as we've gathered around these ideas, I pray, Lord, that you will let us courageously take the steps to make the change necessary to release the power in our, in our life that you've put there, the potential. Let it go, God, from spiritual potential energy to spiritual kinetic energy. In the mighty name of Jesus.